Well, welcome, and thank you very much for coming. My name is Paul Hayward, and I am the Dean of the Faculty of the Social Sciences here at the University of Toronto. It gives me very great pleasure to introduce the second annual Packard Lecture hosted by the University's Science, Technology and Society Research Priority Group. The Science, Technology and Society Priority Group, known as STS, was launched in 2010. It is one of 13 strategic research priority groups supported by the university. And it promotes research across the social sciences, the arts and humanities, engineering, science, and medicine and health, as well as research on our China and Malaysia campuses. SDS engages with researchers at all career stages, fostering interdisciplinarity and research collaborations, and seeking out opportunities for engagement with external partners. No aspect of life in contemporary society is untouched by science and technology. We face major challenges in terms of, for instance, translating new scientific knowledge into practical innovations, or the need to maintain public trust and support for scientific research, and ensuring that we address the social, economic, and ethical issues raised by the development of new technologies. The growing importance of these challenges is increasingly reflected in national and European policy, and also in the emphasis being placed on public engagement and assessing impact. Water, in particular, is a vital but potentially finite resource for society and the environment. And will be a theme running through much of our research program on the changing relationship between science, technology, and society. <coughs> Papelwick is a magnificent working example of a Victorian pumping station. It was once key to the provision of water in Nottingham. The university has a very direct interest in the history of <coughs> Papelwick pumping station, as the plans of its buildings and equipment are in the care of our manuscripts and special collections section. Although this is a relatively small group of papers, it includes plans of buildings and equipment going back to Papelwick's late 19th century origins. The papers are held alongside the significant holdings of water archives at the University's Kings Meadow campus. They cover both the story of local water supply and the history of the region's rivers and drainage. Many references to Papelwick also appear in the 19th century records of the Nottingham Corporation Waterworks. These archives are relevant to a wide range of subjects, from health hygiene to the infrastructure of water supply and management. And they attract increasing levels of research interest both within and beyond the university. The Trust's interest in promoting the pumping station as an education centre focused on water adds still further to the potential partnership opportunities, opening the door to formal and informal learning on water literacy. The university has, in partnership with the Papelwick Trust and Seven Trust Water, secured ESRC funding for a collaborative doctoral student to research water literacy. Professor Pat Thompson, director of the Centre for Advanced Studies and Professor of Education, is also working in partnership with Papelwick's Water Education Trust, or WET, as part of a network of local schools and artists developing both their water literacy and their scientific and technical knowledge. The Papelwick Trust is particularly concerned to promote water literacies for the next generation, to increase knowledge, responsible attitudes, 
and skills in children and young people so that they can make well-informed choices about water at home as well as regionally, nationally and globally. A partnership with the School of Education has brought together internationally recognised expertise and local networks to enable the Trust to help fulfil its water educational mission. The university team has worked with the Papelwick director to design the WET project. Two primary and three secondary schools have been invited to choose how, over two years, they will develop new approaches to learn about water. These five schools can tailor the programme to suit their needs, strengths and interests. Teachers, in consultation with students, choose which topic they will take as their starting point for investigation, for instance, climate change, water poverty, or water wastage. They then call on additional disciplinary support from experienced <coughs> science, geography, and history teachers, as well as the services of a filmmaker, a writer, visual and movement artist, and a musician. The artists support the teachers to create avenues for children to explore the selected topic, get new information, try out <coughs> ideas, and generate artifacts which de demonstrate their learning. So the work of the School of Education and the University's SDS Priority Group with the Public Trust provide a good example of how an opportunity to bring together academics and external partners can offer positive benefits for the community as a whole both for current researchers and for the next generation. This represents both an exciting and an opportune area for continued collaboration with the Applewood Trust. Therefore, on behalf of the University and the Science, Technology and Society Priority Group, I would like very much to welcome you and also to thank Geoffrey Bond, Chairman of the Papawick Pumpkin Station Trust, for suggesting and for sponsoring tonight's lecture. So now, I'm very happy to hand you over to Geoffrey, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you very much. Well, Dean, thank you very much for that very interesting introduction to tonight's uh, lecture. We are, uh, uh, all of us as trustees, and I'm pleased to say there's five of my colleagues here this evening, immensely indebted your university professor, not only for matters of recent time, but that we've had a trustee uh, on the Papua Public Station Trust since we started back in the early 1970s. So we do value greatly the association with Nottingham University. So honoured guests, fellow trustees, Lady Devon, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honour for me to introduce uh, Lord, uh, Lord Devon to you. I nearly said John Gummer, because I've known him for many years. But John uh, was an exhibitioner at what must be his family college, Selwyn College, Cambridge, president of the Cambridge Union and the University's Conservative Association. And as you probably know, he's had a long and distinguished career in Parliament, and is still, I believe, the longest serving Secretary of State for the Environment the UK has ever had. His 16 years of top level ministerial experience included. Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, Minister for London, Employment Minister, and Paymaster General in HM Treasury. His experience as an international negotiator has earned him a worldwide respect, both in the business community and among environmentalists, where he's consistently championed an identity between environment concerns and business sense. This year, as you probably read in the national press, he was appointed Chair of the Committee on Climate Change. <coughs> and Friends of the Earth, in welcoming his appointment, described him as the best Environment Secretary we've ever had. As we know, the Committee on Climate Change is an independent body <coughs> established under the Climate Change Act 2008 to advise the government on emissions, targets, and report to Parliament on progress made in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Lord Devon is the director of a number of companies, including his own, Sandcroft International Limited. Others include Veolia, UK, and Valpac Limited. His many voluntary positions include trustee of the Blue Marine Foundation, the British Architectural Library, 
and he's president of Globe International. This evening, Lord Devon is to give us the second pat pat and annual Papwick lecture. And the title of his talk is Water, a Victorian Vision, and Today's Reality. Ladies and gentlemen, Lord Devon. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I am an unashamed advocate and enthusiast for Papplewick uh, and for all those great examples of the Victorian can-do attitude to love. When you see what a remarkable achievement it is and so many other uh, places, nothing like as glorious as it, you do recognise that we are dealing with a period of our history in which we were perfectly able to imagine great things and to achieve them. Now, I think there's an argument to say that we haven't been like that until very recently. I think there is a, a new spirit alive in Britain. It happened over the last 20 years. Uh, it's uh, the time in which we've begun finally to shake off the uh, nostalgia for empire and beginning to realize that there is a different world out there, and one in which we can operate effectively, competitively, and imaginatively. And I want to start with that word, imagination, because I believe that it is the rarest of all the virtues. Uh, it is very possible for people to travel through their whole lives, never being imaginative about anything and we have met so many of them. They are the dullest people on earth, but there are more of them than the other lot. And the Victorians did have this fantastic ability to be imaginative. And of course, imagination is what takes you to the stage beyond, and that's the stage when the excitements and the miracles happen. So I wanted to start with uh, Victorian imagination. It, it was a remarkable period, and water plays a crucial part throughout it. Of course, the Victorians had a feeling that they were on a conquest route. They, they saw the world as something that you contained and then you conquered. And that was as true of scientific conquest as it was of, uh, uh, of imperial conquest. And in looking at water, they'd be saying to themselves, how do we actually organize this lot so we're in charge? That's why they were so good at naming things. Naming is part of their, their conquest. Once you called it something, then you controlled it in a way. So the uh, fascination they had uh, with uh, uh, different species and with subspecies and with different families and breaking down it was not just because of the scientific advantage of that, it was because it made the world more comprehensible to them, and by that they meant that they controlled it. So, Pabblewick is, uh, first of all, a great example of imagination, but it is, secondly, a great example of their enthusiasm for control. For what it meant was that they could bring together the water that was there, and they could provide it for the great city of Nottingham in a way which it hadn't been before. And the third thing which was so important about their way of looking at water was that they had a view which was uh, remarkable for the time. They saw it as one of the great democratizing elements, that water should be available to all, and it should be clean, and it should be healthy, and it should be safe. And interestingly, it was a politically unifying attitude wasn't something that uh, came from the left or the right, it was something that came from all. And indeed, uh, if you look at what might have been Disraeli's greatest contribution to our history, it isn't making Queen Victoria <coughs> Empress of India. It was much more cleaning up the Thames and stopping the smell and reducing the amount of cholera simply because he did something about public health and water. So, three issues. Imagination, control, and uh, an understanding of the need for democracy. Now, come forward to 
today. There's a terrible Victorian legacy, and that is that we grew up in a period in which we thought water should be free. Now, I'm not going to make a point about how you should pay for it, but I do want to make a point about the fact that it isn't free. Uh, it, it comes out of the air relatively free, and sometimes, as in various parts of Britain, including London today, it comes out rather too much at a time. But it's expensive. Pablowick is expensive. It's been expensive to put it back, and Geoffrey Bond needs a, a huge clap every time we think about it because of the campaign which he's led to make it possible. But it was expensive in the first place, and the provision of water for the city of Nottingham was no mean feat for the people of the time. And yet over the years we have become, we've become sure that somehow or other water is and should be free. And that has caused us a huge difficulty, because that which we think is free is something which we have no concept of conserving. It doesn't cost anything, and therefore I don't need to be careful with it. One of my <coughs> not very favorite politicians is uh, Norman Tippett. But he said something very sane about this, when he said, if you want to understand the nature of people's views about water, think of the difference between the reaction of the father who has found that his son has left the hot water tap on all day, and when he finds his son's left the cold water tap all day. And that sums up the difficulty. Hot water is a private uh, good. Cold water is a public need. And we have to have that, I think, in the back of our minds as we begin to look at what we need to deal with in today's world. In that excellent introduction, there was a phrase which particularly stuck with me. It was a phrase to remind us that we might be short of water. And for me, the moment of uh, understanding that more than any other was when, in the middle of advising one of our clients, which is Coca-Cola International, in Atlanta, they showed a map of all the areas of the world in which their business was growing. And then they superimposed on that map all the areas in the world which were water stressed or were likely to become water stressed. And the two fitted almost exactly. And then they said, we believe we have a moral duty to do something about water supply. But that shows why we have a business need. Because there is no license to supply fizzy drinks if people don't have clean water. There is no way that people are going to allow you to run a business whose major ingredient is water unless they are clear that you understand what water conservation means and what it means to the, the society which you serve. Now for me that was a remarkable moment because, and I'm allowed to tell this story, and it's a very, uh, it's a very <laughs> illustrative story. The very first time I went to Atlanta in order to start the long story of uh, dealing with sustainability with Coca-Cola, the world's most powerful brand, they said to me, well, how, 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 where, do we, where do we start? And I said, well, you start, in my view, with your biggest ingredient, water. Don't you ever say that again. <laughs> it isn't. <laughs> now, today, they glorified it. But at that stage, of course, it was still the end of that view that somehow or other, water was worthless. And therefore, if you said it was the biggest ingredient, even though that were true, you were suggesting that the product wasn't worth anything very much. <laughs> now today, of course, we have a different view, but it shows how recent that is. It was 10 years, because the first story I told you was five years ago. It was only 10 years between that statement and the statement in which they saw it as a business necessity to handle water properly. Now, of course, there are some people who are silly enough to think that somehow or other, 
This is all uh, very low-level stuff. Somehow or other, uh, businesses really haven't got a part to play in this. It's all to be done to break United Nations and uh, superior level. I just have to say, the only really effective things that are happening in this world, um, in a direct and powerful way, are done by businesses, because that is the powerful strength of the market. And they're doing it not because they've all become terribly um, uh, morally driven, although it's surprising, perhaps not surprising, it's uh, certain that many are. It is because people are beginning to understand that at the heart of the business problem is resource. And that it isn't the resource that we've always talked about. The Victorians, after all, used to employ a very large number of people. And when Papplewick was built, I haven't seen the exact numbers, but there must have been hundreds, if not thousands of people, building it and its career. And nobody minded much, because there were lots of people around. And you didn't pay them very much. And there was always somebody else to come if uh, this person didn't like it. Of course, that is what caused our ability to make savings. Because what we've done for that 150 years is very simple. We have uh, reduced our costs by reducing the number of people we employ. Almost all our uh, efficiency savings have been done on a people basis. Now we live in a world in which we have lots of people. Indeed, very, very soon, we have nine billion of them. The bit we don't have are the very resources which we've used to replace people. And, and therefore, we are so lucky to be living at this very special moment. Because this is the moment in which not just Coca-Cola, but the whole of our society is beginning to understand that it's no longer a matter of how you become efficiency through efficient through employing fewer people. It's now a matter of how you become efficient, indeed, how you continue to exist by employing more efficiently the resources that we have. And at the heart of that is water. Water for all the reasons that we know, but for even deeper ones. We should never forget that at the heart of every great religion is water. Children are baptized. People wash in the Ganges. In so many religions, water itself has a divinity. I can't think, I've tried very hard, I can't think of a single religion except the obviously potty, like Scientology or the Mormons. <laughs> the fact is, I can't think of a single religion where water isn't at the heart of the, uh, of the iconography, even if it isn't at the heart of the ritual. And that's not surprising, because we can do without food for much longer than we can do without water. Our body is largely made of water. Water is, as we all know, right at the heart of everything that is. But we've always assumed that it is always going to be there. It's, we, we know there are places that don't have it, but then they always be like that. We don't accept that. They got it. They got it. But in general, we've never thought of a world in which it is possible to say that the world is going to be short of water. And yet that is precisely what most scientists would now tell you, that, that we are now reaching the very edges of our use of fresh water. Now, beyond that, of course, you can imagine circumstances in which uh, desalination will provide you with uh, additional water. You can imagine a great deal of saving of water. Uh, I use the same example because it may stick in people's minds, but it's uh, uh, 15 years ago it took 12 litres of water to make a litre of coke, and it now takes one and a half litres of water to make a litre of coke. That's, a, that's, that's what's happened. It's happened not because they've been good, but because simply they haven't got 12 litres of water. Uh, and, and they certainly can't afford 12 litres of water as people are starting charging for it 
at a reasonable and sensible cost for its value. So we are facing a world in which 9 million people will want the same access to water that only 50 years ago 3 billion people wanted. And we're facing a world in which 9 billion people will want all the things that only water makes possible. So it's no longer just a matter of pumping it from where it is. It's a matter of sharing it in a way which we have not thought of before. And that's where my bit about democracy comes. Because I don't see how you can treat water unless you, you start with that one element that is true in the comments of people who believe that water is free. The thing that's true about that statement is that it ought to be available for everybody. Now, that doesn't mean to say it's free, and indeed to make it free is one of the ways of ensuring it isn't available for anyone. You go to Peru, for example. If you live in the centre of Lima, you have water on tap. If you go and to one of the townships on the edges, the, the equivalent, equivalent in Peru of favelas, if you go there, the water arrives in a tanker, it costs you a great deal of money. That's not because they couldn't supply water, it's because the rich people in the centre don't want them to supply water, because they are frightened that that would increase their water charges, as indeed it would, because it's a much more complex thing to spread the water that much wider. So who has opposed it on all occasions? It is the haves in order so that they don't have to pay for the have-nots. I use that example because it's true. I'm not suggesting for one moment that the people of Peru are any different from the people of Nottingham. The fact of the matter is, we do tend to think like that. <coughs> what we have, we hold, and the idea of extending it to others at too much of a cost to ourselves is always a very difficult one. But it does seem to me that we have, as we think about water today, to remember that the bit of the Victorian vision, which was somehow or other it ought to be free, that it ought to be something which was a good available to all, has got at the heart of it a very clear fact, which it needs, which is that democratic demand. But it does not necessarily mean that we will do it in the same way as we've done it up to now. One of the truths is that only 6% of the water that uh, is provided by your local water company, is used for drinking or ingestion of any kind. The 94% is used for all sorts of other things, and yet we clean it to the level uh, that uh, would enable you to drink all of it. Now that isn't actually very sad, but we're, we are where we are because of the Victorian's imagination. We are there because that's what they provided for us. And because they provided it, everybody assumes that that's what you should have. It is convenient, of course, and quite difficult to see how you provide both clean and not so clean water. It's difficult to see how you get out of a system whereby that is what has happened for everybody's living memory and beyond. But uh, it is a question in developing countries which are very water short as to whether we would wish to export to them a system simply because we think it would be wrong to export something different, to export to them a system which may, in the pretty short term, be almost impossible to maintain. So my first conundrum is what would the Victorians have done about that? I suspect imagination might have come into much greater prominence than it has with us so far. One of the sadnesses about the whole water issue is the degree to which water discussions are so arid. <laughs> I find it trying in the extreme that there is an establishment of water providers who always say one same thing, and there is a collection of water campaigners who also say one thing. And it's mainly that the providers should provide more, more cheaply, in exactly the same way as they always have done. And the amount of thinking about what you do in a world which is short of water is really very small. 
So in order not to be accused of uh, a kind of latent imperialism, although my history would make that difficult to sustain, I want to start with ourselves. Uh, every environmentalist, if he or she is truthful, has to admit the bit of the environment that they can't quite manage. And I have two water bits. One I have conquered, the other I have not. I hate showers. I don't like them. I can't work them. They're either too cold or too hot. I'm furious that everyone is different from another one, and I just don't like them. Now, a bath, on the other hand, is a thoroughly civilized thing. I know what it's like before I get into it. I can warm it up after sitting in it for some time. It's suitable for reading a book in. I noticed that Jilly Cooper said she hadn't got a Kindle because you might drop it in the bath. A sensible view in my estimation. But, but, but I just find it very difficult, although I know that the bath is four times as expensive in water than the shower. Although the length of time that some people shower, I have suspicion about the reality of that statement. So we come to some kind of conclusion. My wife and I share the bath, so we think that's divided by two. That more or less works. And I haven't beaten this issue. I have an excuse, because we don't have a shower and there's no room for a shower. <laughs> you could, of course, rightly say, you could take the bath out and put a shower in instead, but that is actually not going to happen, so there's no. <laughs> what I have managed is cleaning my teeth in running water. And to start with, that's terribly difficult. If it, um, most of you here, I'm sure, are properly brought up and have never run, done their teeth in running water. But, but for those who started off many years ago doing that, because that's what you always did, it's actually very difficult to stop it. You have to learn a whole new technique. And most of the things that we do of that kind, we do by instinct. It's a thing you get used to, you always do it that way. And yet when you work out how much water you save by not doing it under running water, you just have to. And I have learned to do that. As my wife's here, I think I have to admit that not all the family have followed suit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it is quite difficult. <laughs> but the, the point I raise is, I raise with this, is because there, is, there are huge numbers of things that we can all do which make a tremendous difference to the amount of water we say. Um, I was once interviewed by John Humphreys, um, and in the very short moments between his uh, statements, um, I, uh, I, managed to, I managed to get in that you could save a great deal of money, and importantly, not only water, but a great deal of money is from energy, because after all, the biggest cost of water is pumping the stuff round. Uh, if we just boiled as much water as we wanted for the cup of coffee, rather than constantly brew a whole kettle of, of water, and he said, oh, he said, don't be so sorry, I can't matter, that doesn't matter at all. We did the figures, it is huge. It is really enormous if we all did it. And we all can do it. And if you notice that you can now not buy old-fashioned kettles very easily, you buy a kettle which shows how much water you've put into it. And increasingly, people actually do this. So there are, without getting into these huge issues, so very simple ways of uh, reducing the amount of water that we use, and that's going to be more and more important. Now, why is it going to be more and more important? Well, there is the overwhelming thing, the, the, the issue of world water balance. But there are also some other things which I think we have to face, and which the Victorians would, in an odd way, have been able to deal with better than we. The thing about the Victorians was that they were serious about science. Now, there were some people, like Sophie Sam and others, who thought science was a thoroughly dangerous and mischievous activity. But at least they were serious about it. They combated against it. They fought it. They argued. They, they thought it worthwhile taking on. Samuel Wilberforce thought that Thomas Henry Huxley was, was worth arguing with. One of the problems of our day is that there are very many people, and lots of them in public places, who are rather proud of not understanding <coughs> science and not wanting to understand science. 
a kind of, well, those clever Johnnies may well have this idea, but they're always changing their mind, and it's no point at all in trying to do what they want you to do, because next year it'll be something different. Now, admittedly, this is partially the problem of the Daily Mail, in the sense that <coughs> if you tell everybody every day something new is going to kill them, you end up by giving up, i.e. you give up worry, because there's no point in, in listening to it all, because you wouldn't eat anything, drink anything, do anything, because all of it is thoroughly dangerous. And we know that the most popular pages of the newspapers are the pages which discuss health and welfare, and particularly that discuss how you're going to die and how to avoid it. <laughs> and in a secular society, of course, this is the most important uh, act in life, to keep life going because you don't think there's anything else, so you may as well try to extend it. The Victorians rather sensibly thought there was something else, they weren't quite so um, uh, obsessed with it. Uh, but, th but they also did have, in general, a real respect for science and technology. And so uh, scientists were able to get people to listen to them sufficiently to achieve some of their ends. Not all, but a great deal. I wonder whether today we could actually have had the railway age. When you think of the protests that we have merely to have high speed to. Just think of the whole of middle class England standing out against any railway anywhere here <coughs> all the time. And as here is everywhere, that is exactly what we do. <coughs> we have created a society in which it is extremely difficult for people to listen to the realities of technology and science. And before you all uh, think to yourself about how awful those people are, just think of the last time you didn't like whatever it was somebody was suggesting to do just down the road from you. It's always a good excuse for the one that's near you, whereas other people ought to be much more broad-minded than we are ourselves. So we do have a problem, and we have a problem particularly when it comes to climate change. And of course, water. Water is at the central, central issue of climate change. Because uh, what climate change will do is to make the supply of water peculiarly difficult. There will be too much of it at some times of the year, and too little of it at other times of the year. It will come down with a, an intensity which we have not experienced before. When people, when people see the sort of rain we had in London today, and indeed the rain we have so widely, it is different. That phrase in the hymn about soft, refreshing rain ain't true any longer. It comes down like it used to come down in the middle of the tropics. And we know that, and we know that it has changed, and that this is going to be a continuing feature of our lives. And of course, we have a totally unsuitable infrastructure to deal with it because we've managed to mould drain most of our fields, so the water comes down and hits the fields. They're very compacted fields, because we put very heavy um, vehicles on top of it. The water comes down, hits it, goes into the drains, and goes straight out the sea. So we don't even catch the stuff. Um, and uh, we know that the incident of flooding is increasing all the time. I see that the Environment Agency has uh, pressed that there will be uh, very significant floods over this next coming 10 days. And part of the reason is simply that we don't have the infrastructure to deal with the water. Leave alone catch it, because actually this is what we would be doing. But uh, we uh, find ourselves instead doing terrible things, like the ludicrous proposition of Thames water to build a great, a great sort of vast uh, pipe all the way around London, because they haven't learnt that we have moved on a bit from the Victorian times when that was the one solution they would have had, and we have a whole lot of others. And, and why is it that we find it so difficult to come to terms with these water realities? I'd suggest to you it is because of this hatred of listening to science. Uh, climate change is not arguable. I didn't used to say that. I used to say, even if it isn't true, there are all sorts of other reasons why we have to do what we have to do, like nine billion people. Uh, we do have to do all those things that climate change demands in any case. I used to say, well, it's um, 
precautionary anyway, and uh, we should, in fact, um, be careful to pay an insurance premium, which isn't very great, in case the scientists or those who believe in climate change are right. I used also to say something which I still say, which is, I'd much prefer it to be wrong. It is extremely inconvenient. I rather hate the fact that Mr. Gore chose the inconvenient truth as the name for his film because it sounds as if I'm merely repeating that, but it isn't. It's a, a reality. It would be much more convenient if climate change were not so. Which is why that Lord Lawson is obviously wrong when he suggests that somehow or other there's a great international plot to force climate change on us. It is the most unacceptable thing to have to accept. Nobody would invent it, even in order to get large sums of money from the uh, uh, various don don uh, giving bodies. Uh, and uh, I hear that um, more, more money from all sorts of organisations here, and I know that uh, Nottingham University, which is a very fine university, is pretty good at getting some of that money. And, uh, 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 but it doesn't need to invent climate change in order to get it. <laughs> the idea that somehow or other it's invented for that purpose or that it's, as I have heard said, a Marxist plot. <laughs> having, having lost the argument on uh, the economy, we've got to find some other way of having central uh, direction, and therefore this is the way to re-establish the need for central direction. Now, you may sound think that's very odd, but more people in America believe that than believe in uh, evolution. That's one of the... Peculiar. In fact, I think it's not quite true that more people believe that we haven't landed on the moon than believe in climate change, but it's pretty close to, <laughs> in, in that situation in the United States. So, so we are in a position in which it is perfectly proper and possible to stand up and say it ain't true. And isn't it interesting how you can do that without any scientific um, expertise? If you haven't read the remarkable article called... Uh, the Galileo fraud, uh, do do so. Because in this, a novelist uh, writes about the curious way in which we have begun to believe that because Galileo was a heretic in the science of his time, but was right, then all heretics against the science of their time are right, and all those who are mainstream are wrong. This is uh, an obvious nonsense, but that is precisely what lies behind the argument. And then she goes on to talk about this curious way in which science is used as if, as if any science counts. So the climatologist uh, who is going to explain to you about climate change is not argued with by another climatologist. It's argued with by Matt Ridley who, insofar as he is a scientist, and he is, is an expert in the uh, marital arrangements of pheasants. Now, <laughs> this is a very important issue. Uh, pheasants are uh, very important birds. I shoot them and I enjoy it. And, and, I, and, I want them, and I want them to be very healthy. And I eat them because I enjoy them. And I don't believe you should shoot what you don't eat. And that's very good. But the idea that you can know about that and are therefore as equal a conversationalist on, on climate change as a climatologist seems to me to be one of the great heresies of our time. And the Victorians were not like that. They did understand that there were disciplines and that the argument, the argument used to be was, was, was where did the discipline stop? That was Sophie Sam's argument. He said it was all right to have all this stuff, but um, you shouldn't get into theology. And, and, and of course, uh, Huxley and others were saying, well, we're not getting into theology. We're just following the science through. There were those sort of divisions. But uh, at least the Victorians had a respect both for science and technology, which we would do well to recover. In Britain, for example, if you use the word engineer, it probably means the man who mends your television set. We, we seem to have lost that respect which we had for Brunel. Yeah, yeah. Now that does mean, of course, that in today's world, dealing with water, we have to recognise that we are faced with all sorts of problems in trying to come 
to sensible decisions. And I want to end by just delineating where those problems are and suggesting very quickly what we should do about them. The first is, as I have suggested, the problem that you can't talk about anything but very boringly staid answers to these huge problems. You can't, for example, ask yourself, should we be extending into the countryside of India piped water? Or should we find a different way? Perhaps paralleling our idea of distributed energy, uh, distributed water supplies. Should we be thinking differently about water prepared for drinking and cooking and water prepared for cleaning and washing? When we talk about our plans for a much less invasive kind of building in the future in Britain, the changes in the building regulations and all the rest, we've done a bit about water, but we certainly haven't made it compulsory to have uh, grey water systems. Uh, do you know that we, we tell people that they can't be an electrician <coughs> unless they've got a certificate? But you can be a plumber and you can put the water of the whole area at danger because your grey water system starts to flush back into the white water system because you don't need a cystography. Well, maybe you may do it even when you've got it, but you're just more likely not to if you are a properly registered plumber. And only about 16% of the plumbers in Britain are properly registered because there's nothing in it for them, because nobody ever asks them. You're so thankful to have found a plumber, <laughs> and particularly one that speaks enough English for you to be able to explain what it is that you want done, that you don't care any longer. So nobody says, I want to look at your certificate, because that's not what you think is important. Somehow or other, we've got to lift the importance of water up, so that people can recognise just how big are the changes going to be. That's why we have to meter water and why we have to charge for it according to the meter. That's why rich people have got to uh, pay more than poor people. That's why if you have a swimming pool, the water you put into it ought to be significantly more expensive for every uh, pint uh, uh, than the water that you're using to drink. When, when, uh, I'm the chairman of the water company and until recently we provided the water for much of the area around London and we were one of the first companies to be given permission to have compulsory metering. And I refused to have compulsory metering, and metering until we could have a rising block tariff so that we could give relatively cheap water for the families and then uh, another ban just above that and then really rather expensive water for people who wanted to use it in, in, in ways which were not priority ways. And that was because in Folkestone and Dover, one of our companies, we have very little water resource and we are increasingly unable to supply unless we supply sensibly. So the first thing is we've got to be able to talk about this much more sensibly. It's only after all 14 years ago that the political parties split on metering and it was the political policy at the election of the, current, of the party that won, you see how careful I'm trying to make sure I don't say which one, it was their policy to stop water metering because they said that it was unfair. So we now have a system of water measurement which is half-baked and water payment, which has got nothing whatsoever to do with reality. And what happens today is that the only people who are metered are the ones who save money by that. And who are they? They're the people who are rich enough, educated enough to make those choices. So who pays the biggest bills? Well, the poorest. That's the system that we have, and we have to change that. That's a very central system. And I remind you of that word democratization. Second thing we've got to do is to begin to recognise that water is a scarce resource, very expensive to deliver. Biggest price, biggest cost in any water company's uh, accounts is after staff is electricity for pumping. 
We therefore have to do something about it for climate change, direct climate change reasons as well. And we've really got to change our way of looking at water. I want us to get back to the way in which people in Nottingham first thought of water when it first arrived from Papelwood. People who'd never had water on tap. Even those who were taking it from a standpipe. But it was a standpipe in their street. Instead of having to go long distances to get water which they couldn't rely on. They knew it was clean, they knew it was safe, and it was there, there for them. And that, we have to recover that wonder at this remarkable product. So, secondly, we've got to recover a, a reverence for water, which is rather closer to the natural human attitude. I remind you about that religious symbolism. And then thirdly, we have to recognise that water is very much the surrogate for so much which is health. It's the surrogate for the healthy fish and uh, biodiversity of our rivers. Clean water, enough of it, is crucially important. That's why I'm deeply opposed to the proposals of off what in the new water bill. And if you didn't read the article by Charles Clover in yesterday's uh, or Sunday's Sunday Times, Google it, because it sums up why we are still in the hands of people who don't understand that water is too important to be treated in this ludicrously uh, offhand way. And so we need to use that symbol of health. I want us to be able to say about our generation that what the Victorians started in cleaning up the Thames, we finished by not only cleaning up our rivers, but by ensuring that the flow is as good as we can make it in a generation when that flow will inevitably be less powerful simply because of climate change. And fourthly, I want us to recover an understanding of water as a universal good. There can be no battle against climate change unless there is more social justice in the world. Why should people in India who are really looking to how they're going to feed their family this week, or even today, think about what they should be doing to protect their family in 20, 30 years' time. You cannot ask people whose immediacy is to save the lives of those they love to think more long-term. So you've got to put them into a position in which they are more secure and have a greater share of the world's resources. We can't turn to the rest of the world and say, look here, we have grown rich on pollution. That's why we're rich. Here we are in Nottingham. We're only here because of the pollution which previous people left behind for us to clear up. We have grown rich. Now, what we want you to do is to um, not grow very rich, really, um, in order that we can go on keeping that share that we've got now and which, to get, we have endangered your planet. Oh, our planet as well, but your planet. So my fourth point is this. Water is going to be one of those things which I hope will enable us to learn the fundamentally exciting fact of our generation. I get very bored when Greenpeace speaks because they always make you miserable. In the end, it's a, a terrible world we live in. There's so much to do. There are so many unpleasant people. My goodness, and if we've solved that one, there'll be another one. And everything we do has got untoward consequences. You do, in the end, say, well, let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. I believe we have to be different from that. I think we have to lift the heart. And what an exciting world we live in. For the first time in history, man cannot be imperialist. That's the problem for the poor old Americans. They've become the imperial power at the very moment when you can't be imperial. 
I mean, that's exactly what uh, that's exactly what that ridiculous and damaging and illegal and immoral war in um, uh, in Iraq was about. It was about the old imperial answer. It was you went in there, you bashed them up, and told them what they ought to do because you were right. Well, actually, we were right, but that's not how you achieve your ends. It's not about being right, it's about being effective. And in this world, imperialism is no longer effective because that's what the internet, that's what television, that's what communication has done. It has made it necessary for us to recognize that if we want, if we want to solve global problems like the problems of water, we're going to have to solve them in global ways. And if you want people to work with you, on a battle of this kind, then you've actually got to make sure that you are making it possible for them to make these choices themselves. This is not the place for imposition. So I finish with this. We are living in the biggest change of human thought about ourselves since the Renaissance. This is the exciting moment to live. There are people in this audience who've got much more of it to live than I have and some others. But even we have to say we're jolly lucky to be part of this huge change. And we should be welcoming it, recognising how difficult it is. Of course, these huge changes are. But as I began, it's much better than being bored. <laughs> Excitement is much more likely to keep us alive longer and also give us the challenge that we need. And our challenge is to learn from the Victorians. A respect for science, a determination to achieve, a can-do attitude, a real belief that what we do can be done beautifully, which is a very important part of Pavelwick. It's lovely. This is not something that is contradictory. Whereas we've gone through a period in which anything that's supposed to be uh, uh, public or uh, works has got to be ugly. Of course, they never work. They always leak. There's always something wrong with that kind of so-called utilitarian building. So here we are. The most exciting time that we could have lived in since about 1400. And therefore we should rejoice in it and say, let us learn from our great ancestors, let us build on the fact that we now have a society, at least in this country, that is increasingly a can-do society. And let's make sure that water becomes for us the symbol of a new world in which democracy, respect, reverence, and a serious view of our resources become the centre part of our decisions, not just because of climate change, although my goodness it's essential for that, but because otherwise we won't feed, clothe and house nine billion people. And we won't have enough resources to give to our own people those things which they have come to expect and without which they will find it impossible to understand what has happened. Why are we like that? Well, those of us in leadership roles and those of us who hope to be in leadership roles better get on with that solution. Otherwise, we won't hold those roles for very long. very much indeed, Lord Devon, for that uh, extremely entertaining but deadly serious talk. Um, you ranged widely. You reminded us of the debt of gratitude we owe to our Victorian <coughs> forefathers. You talked in particular about their imagination, their control, their commitment to democratisation all the hugely important themes. You, you also talked about the importance of respecting and understanding disciplinary expertise. I thought that was a, a very well-made point. 
And there is a tendency, I think, for just any media, because they happen to be a public figure, to be allowed to opine on any issue. I'm a political scientist, um, and so a lot of the issues that you were talking about were of particular interest to, to me, and especially issues around the question of resource politics and how we deal with the shortage of resources, water being a key one that the world is facing. And of course, political scientists have to deal with the critical issue of intergenerational justice. How do we, how do we deal with these questions of accepting our good fortune to be living in the time that we're living, but recognizing that the benefits that we get are going to be uh, paid for by our succeeding generations. These are extremely difficult questions. And one of the key issues, I think, one of the key things we have to focus on in order to do anything about it is education. That's why those of us who work in the education sector do so, because we believe it is absolutely fundamental and critical for the future. And unless we understand better the historical legacies, which you so clearly and imaginatively set out yourself, and unless we understand some of the key challenges that we face, we can't possibly hope to find those global solutions that you quite rightly expressed a need to find. Uh, on the question of intergenerational justice, in my own case, the intergenerational justice which goes on in my family revolves around showers and baths. Um, with two teenage children, I can assure you that they use far more water and showers than my wife ever does when she has a bath. Um, but these are, these are really important issues. I think you, you've brought them to life for us in uh, a speech which I think managed to combine uh, fantastic uh, engagement of the audience with some really hugely important, deeply serious and, and thought-provoking <coughs> ideas. And you also managed to do that without being party political. And I thought that was a, a very impressive achievement. So can I ask the audience, please, to show their appreciation in the way. Thank you very much. next year for yet another scintillating and brilliant speaker and in the meantime do come and see us at Patrick. Thank you all and again to Lord Devon and to Lady Devon for coming this evening and speaking so brilliantly to us. Thank you very much.